So we're continuing on our series, How Not to Read the Bible. And my topic tonight is, is the Bible sexist and anti-women? So it's a bit of a loaded topic here tonight. I'd, I'd just like to start by just giving a quick content warning that there's some difficult subject that I'm going to talk about tonight that may be painful for some women. And if I stir up anything unintentionally, um, I'll just apologise ahead of time. And I'd love you to go and talk to Jen at some stage during the week or after or, or whenever, you know, you can catch up with her um, uh, because I don't want to do that. I don't want to stir stuff up without providing a way for you to sort of deal with that. So, yeah, just thanks for letting me say that to start with. So, yeah, how is the Bible sexist and anti-woman? You might be thinking, well, I'm not really interested in this topic. Maybe if you're a guy, you're thinking, well, I treat women very nicely. There's no issue there. You know, I would never interpret the Bible that way. Or maybe if you're a woman, you may have had the um, blessing of always being around men who support you and encourage you. Um, but I just want to say it is an issue. It is an issue out there in our culture. A few years ago, um, a young woman came to me and said to me, Kathy, I cannot um, follow Jesus. I cannot call myself a Christian if I have to accept the Old Testament as part of, of that whole thing because of what it says about women. And that kind of sent me on a journey. I didn't really have the resources and the tools to address her question at that time. And it's kind of sent me on a journey of trying to read and study the Old Testament in a little bit more detail so that I can, you know, provide a more, more solid answer to that issue. Um, and I think we're going to have to know our four principles of Bible interpretation that we've been reading over the last few weeks if we're going to get around our heads around this topic of women in the Old Testament particularly. So let's make a start. What are our four principles of Bible interpretation that we've been going through? Who can tell me one of them? Never read a Bible verse. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, it means don't pull a single verse out of context and make your whole theology about that one verse until you've read the whole context unless you've read what else the Bible says on that topic. Okay, so we've got one. What's another one? Yep. It's written for us, not to us, which means that, uh, you know, we were not the original recipients of these, um, of these documents. And so we need to understand... Uh, what these documents meant to the original readers if we're going to understand what it means to us today. Okay, so we've got two. Other one? There's two more. Jen. Ah, you got the two last ones in one go. Excellent. So the Bible is not a single book. It's a library of books and it contains books with different styles of writing, which means we need to consider the genre of what we're reading before we try to interpret it. And the Bible is a whole unified story that points to Christ. So there are four principles. Um, so, so we're going to talk tonight in four areas. One, I'm going to start by talking about women in the beginning. What, what was God's original design for men and women? Then let's look at this difficult area of women in the Old Testament. Then we're going to move on and talk about Jesus and women and how he treated women. And very briefly, look at a few of the things that Paul said about women. And I want to make the case to you tonight that I don't believe the Bible is anti-woman. I don't believe the story of the Bible is a sexist story. I actually think the message of the Bible presents a radical way to actually achieve, um, achieve equality in a way that the world can't achieve it. And, it, and I reckon the Bible part, uh, paves this radical path forward. Um, of a new way of doing community, a new way of being inclusive, men and women together, walking together in community. And it's a community that's based on servanthood, mutual submission and respect. So let's make a start. In the beginning, in the beginning, page one of your Bible. Let's look at Genesis 1. And you see here that men and women were created together in the image of God. Then God said, if we could have the first slide up, please, thank you. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky 
over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So you see there that men and women are created together to be God's image bearers in the world. And men and women are given that same responsibility of taking God's dominion, God's beautiful loving rule over the new beautiful world that God has created. Let's have a look at Genesis 2. I want to make the point tonight that, um, you know, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are not conflicting creation stories. So Genesis 1 gives you this big panoramic view of all that God has created. And then Genesis 2 hones in on the pinnacle of God's creation, which is the creation of people. So I'm just going to read a bit of that story in Genesis 2 from about verse 20. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Now ladies, don't get caught up on that whole rib story. You know, it's poetic language. It's a beautiful picture. And rib could also be translated side. So the point is man and woman are two sides and together they make a whole. The other thing that sometimes women struggle with is this word helper, that the woman is the helper. And I think the problem is, is that our English language kind of sees sometimes that as a bit of a demeaning term. It's kind of like maybe a secretary or some kind of lower position, a, a household servant or something like that. But if you read that word in the Hebrew, the word is Eza. And that's a really powerful word. It's talked about um, in relation to God. So, for example, Psalm 33:20, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help, Eza, and our shield. So really, it's a very strong word. It's, it's saying that this woman is going to be, um, be, be, going to be a powerful strength in this male-female um, you know, bond. She's going to be this influential uh, uh, contributor to the rule of God's image bearers over all creation. So I think we, can, we, we don't need to see that as a demeaning sort of picture of woman. And so you can see in the beginning, God created male and female both to be God's image bearers and gave them the same mission and responsibilities over the creation, God's good world that he made. But we know it doesn't go all according to plan. And then in Genesis 3, you see the introduction of sin into the world. These two, Adam and Eve, decide to take, they want to decide what's good and evil for themselves and they reject God, and sin comes into this beautiful world. And we see there that sin is the root of this power struggle that, that you know, is, eventuates between men and women. You see in Genesis 3.16, uh, the Lord says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So there is the origin of the conflict between men and women that we see play out, played out in our world. It's caused by sin. And this is, I think, a very helpful thing to see because when we tell the whole story of the Bible, when we say, you know, we're not just going to pick out a little bit of it, but we're going to make sure we understand this is a unified story, I think it can help people when they come to the Old Testament and say, well, why, why is there this this uh, patriarchal culture that seems to put down women in the Old Testament. Well, we can say, well, it started with sin. That's, it wasn't God's original design. So let's move on to the Old Testament. If I could have my next slide, please. So I've just spent the last six months reading from Genesis all the way to 2 Kings. And, you know, I have to say it's a hard read for a 21st century woman you know, I think we have to be honest about that when people come to us with questions. It's not an easy, an easy read. Um, there are some very difficult 
passages that describe horrific abuse of women and other sorts of mistreatment of women. And you're kind of wondering, you know, you can understand how some people can really struggle with some of this stuff. But I want to encourage you to apply these principles that we've been learning um, about, about how do we read this book, this difficult book. And two of the principles I want you to really note in relation to the Old Testament is understanding the genre of the text, the style of writing, and also understanding the cultural context that it's written into. Um, so, you know, how many of you under 30 have ever rolled your eyes at something your parents did? Honesty time here. A few. Pete has. <laughs> They're only one generation away from you. And already, you know, it's hard for us older people to keep up with our, 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 you know, our offspring. But imagine if we're not just talking about one generation. We're talking about, you know, a few thousand years when we go back to the start, the origins of when the Old Testament was written. So we have to come with a certain level of humility. You can't come to the Old Testament, you know, with your placard, you know, saying, you know, we believe in human rights and all that kind of stuff. You've got to, reading the Old Testament is a cross-cultural exercise. And so you need to place yourself and understand a little bit about that culture. So let's give a couple of examples of that. So um, understanding the genre. So a lot of the Old Testament is written in what we would call narrative prose which just simply means it's just narrating the events. It's telling the story of history. It's not saying whether they were good things or bad things. It's just telling the story. It's not necessarily condoning any behaviour. And I think that's helpful to note. You read the story of Abraham and Sarah, for instance, and you kind of think, how could Abraham do some of those things? Why is God saying it's okay for this man to be treating his wife in, in a particular way? And, you know, the Bible is not condoning that. It's just telling the story. Or an, another example would be the book of Judges. Now in that case, the narrator specifically in the book of Judges is telling a pretty gruesome story to make the point about the moral and spiritual decline of the people of Israel. Um, I don't know if you were here a, a couple of visits ago when Josh, our, our senior leader, came and he actually preached from the last couple of chapters of, of the book of Judges, which are a really horrific, gruesome story with, with elements of abuse in there. But, you know, the writer of the Judges is telling what happened to the people of Israel once they got into the Promised Land and after their great leader, Joshua, had died. So they were fine while Joshua's alive and the other leaders who remembered what God had done. But once they died, these people, the next generation, forgot God. And um, they turned away from God to idols. And the writer of the Judges is showing this spiral decline down, down, down as the people got further and further and further away from God. And, and the writer to the Judges is including this horrific story at the end because he's saying this is what happens when you turn away from God. And he's presenting it as such a tragedy because these people were meant to demonstrate what it's like to live under the, God's beautiful rule. And yet they end up being worse than the nations around them. So whilst some of these passages are still very painful to read, if we understand why they're there, then we can start to make sense of it. Um, another, another style of writing that you find in the Old Testament is, of course, the Old Testament law. Um, and there are some parts of the law that are very hard for us as women to, to you know, understand what they're doing there in the, uh, in the Bible. And, you know, we can't explain those parts away as being just narrating the story because these are more um, specific directions to God's people. And one of the ones that comes up, uh, people will often say, is, well, what about that law where it says that if a woman is raped, then she marries her rapist? You know, it's, it, it just doesn't make sense to us, does it? It just sounds like an awful thing. But we have to understand the cultural context. So in the ancient Near East... A woman had no way of earning her own income. She couldn't just go down the street and get a job in the public service, okay? Um, she was entirely dependent on the men of her culture to provide for her. And so a woman needed to be married 
or she needed another male relative to look after her and shelter her, otherwise she would starve or become a prostitute. They were the choices available to her. So if a man had done the wrong thing and there had been a rape, then that, that woman couldn't get married probably. Um, and it was a terrible thing. And so this law is there um, as a legal protection to such a woman that she would still be provided for. And the law says, you know, that that man is never allowed to divorce her. And it doesn't mean that every woman in the Old Testament that that happened to took, you know, went down that path. So, for example, in the, um, in the story of Tamar, she's sheltered by her brother, Absalom. But it was a financial provision, that law, that was there to provide for a poor woman who perhaps had no other option. So we've got to keep in mind that cultural context. And I want to say very clearly that nothing that you read in the Old Testament justifies any abuse or subjugation of women today. And if anyone has come from a background where the Old Testament has been used in that way, I just want to say I'm so, so terribly sorry. And I would love for you to reach out to another woman and tell your story and receive some healing. But let's look at also some women leaders in the Old Testament. So despite the patriarchal society and the limitations on women in this culture, nevertheless, God continues to raise up women leaders throughout the story of the Old Testament. We can speak about Miriam, who was a worship leader, or Deborah, who was one of the early judges. And Deborah, interestingly enough, is one of the only judges who seeks spiritual renewal of the people of Israel. And in addition, she was a military and political leader. And I also love the many examples of women in the Old Testament who, who kind of found a way to take a risk for God. And God so honours them and lifts them up when that happens. Um, I, I'll just mention Jael, you know, scary tent peg lady. Um, Angie's very favourite example. Um, Rahab, the prostitute who shelters the, the spies at great risk to herself. Um, there is Ruth, of course, and another Tamar who's mentioned in Genesis 38. If you want to be really weirded out by different culture, you can read Genesis 38. Um, but keep in mind, Tamar, that one, ends up in the bloodline of Jesus. She's so honoured for the risk that she took. And I have to tell you about the story of Abigail because I only just came across it in my last um, read through the Old Testament. It's such a beautiful example. And it shows how the Bible is not afraid to, to honour, lift up a woman and compare her in, in very favourable light to another man. Uh, and in this case, it was her husband. Her husband was this guy called Nabal. I don't know if you ever have the word yobbo here in, in Cambridge. you know what a yobbo is? We talk about yobbos in Queanbeyan. Well, you know, not to be disrespectful, but Nabal was a bit of a yobbo. You know, the Bible describes, describes him as mean and surly and Deborah as beautiful and, as, and intelligent. So the Bible is very honest about people's character, you know. Um, and anyway, what happened was the David, who was going to become king, he was there in that region of Nabal's, um, you know, where Nabal lived and his household. And David was kind of keep, keeping an eye out for Nabal's shepherds while they were, they were sh um, shearing the sheep. And anyway, uh, David thinks, well, you know, I've been watching out for this guy. I might just go ask him if we can have some food. And so um, King, well, not King yet, but David sends a servant to Nabal and says, look, you know, I've been watching out for your shepherds. Can you please help me and feed my men? And Nabal is just so ignorant. He doesn't understand this opportunity. This guy's going to be king. And he goes on this little rant and said, you know, what's this guy asking me for food? I'm not giving out all my food, you know, just for anyone who's walking through my land. And, you know, this message gets back to David and David is enraged and he gets his troops ready and he's going to get there and he's going to, you know, um, flatten Nabal's household. And Abigail hears of it and she quickly acts. She doesn't tell her husband. She just quickly gathers up all the food from the household and sends it off to King David and then she follows after her servants and comes and meets King David and um, says, look, I'm so sorry, Lord, you know, um, Please forgive my husband. Let the punishment be upon me. So she's a very brave woman. And then she goes on to teach something to David. She says, my Lord, surely you don't want innocent blood on your hands. Can you please not, don't go through with this whole killing you're planning because, you know, that's, that's going to go bad for you in the long term. 
And David's like taken aback and he's like, oh yeah, oh really? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, (laughs) Abigail, you know. So the great woman teacher and woman who stands up for for God's principles and God really honours her. And it's a beautiful story. Um, I I didn't tell the people the ending of this story at the North Church and someone said to me, you better tell them the ending because everyone's flicking through the Bible trying to find it for themselves and not listening to the next part. So the nice ending of the story is that... um, Nabal kind of drops dead a few days later, just randomly. <laughs> and David marries Abigail. So it's really cool. It's just such a lovely story. So, so, you know, there are always opportunities for us to serve God. You know, it doesn't matter what restrictions, men or women, we find ourselves in, what circumstances we find ourselves in. The, the Spirit is always there to prompt us and show us how we can still make a difference, whatever our circumstances might be. Um, So, despite the difficult passages in the Old Testament, um, the other thing we have to remember is that part of the brokenness we see in the Old Testament, it's there to point us towards Christ. It's there to show us that on of our own devices, humanity, humanity just can't fix the brokenness of the world. And the Old Testament points us forward and says, you know, we need a Messiah. We need God to come and do something that we can't do. And so I want to move on to talk about Christ. And in Christ, we see the greatest example of how God values and lifts up women. So Jesus specifically resists the sexism in his culture. In John chapter 4, you see him giving one-on-one time to a woman, a Samaritan woman of all women. And the disciples come back and they see him and they say, oh my gosh, Jesus is talking to a woman. Doesn't he know he's not supposed to do that? You know, but Jesus is free and generous with his time with women. Jesus sees women as worthy of theological instruction. And you'll all know that story of Mary when she comes and sits at Jesus' feet. Now, um, the, the position at the feet of a Jewish rabbi was reserved for men. A woman wouldn't go and sit at a Jewish rabbi's feet unless the Jewish rabbi was Jesus. And and Jesus also has specific time for Martha. You know, Martha gets a bit of a hard rap sometimes in sermons. But Martha is the recipient of one of the greatest pieces of theology in the whole New Testament when, you know, her brother dies and she goes out to meet Jesus. There's no men around at the time and Jesus says to her, Martha, Don't you know, I'm the resurrection and the life. And interestingly, women come out front and centre as witnesses to all the key moments in the Christian story. Mary is, of course, no one knows better than Mary about the incarnation and the virgin birth. Women are the ones that hung around the cross and saw the crucifixion. All the men, bar John, ran away. And women are first at the tomb and the first heralds of the resurrection. You know, it's really interesting because some people say, oh, you know, you can't really believe those stories about Jesus rising from the dead. That's probably a myth that was created later. But if you were going to make up a myth later in history, you would not have women as the primary witnesses of the resurrection because a woman's testimony was was worthless in the Greco-Roman world. And so women, even in that way, testify to the validity and the authenticity of the gospel accounts. I love these words from a woman called Dorothy Sayers. I don't know if you've heard of her. She was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis and probably even more prolific in her writing than C.S. Lewis. And I'd love to read to you what she says, if we could have those words up on the screen. Thanks. Perhaps it is no wonder that the women were first at the cradle and last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There had never been another a prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronised, who never made arch jokes about them, who never treated them either as the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without demeaning and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, 
who had no axe to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend. And, you know, as we encounter in our world people who struggle with the Bible and struggle what it says about women, you know, we've got to point them to Christ and how he treated women. And for women who are not willing yet to listen to the story of the Bible, we need to model the life of Christ for them so that they get a sense of the fragrance of Christ from us and from our lives. Finally, let's move on. And I'd like to say a couple of things about Paul's view of women, the Apostle Paul. So I want to point out to you that Paul specifically honours um, the women who worked alongside him in the work of the gospel. Um, have a look at Romans 16 sometime this week, the last chapter of the book of Romans. And you'll see there, Paul specifically mentions a number of women who've worked with him. And, you know, he, he values them. He clearly values their ministry and looks... Um, looks favourably upon them. The first woman mentioned is Phoebe in 16.1. And, and that's a very significant thing because in this kind of style of writing, this letter writing that you see um, in this period of history, there would very often be a greeting section. And the first person mentioned is likely to be the person who carried the letter, who was the courier of the letter um, to the place where it was going. And so Paul is entrusting the wonderful theology of the book of Romans to this woman, Phoebe, who's said to be a, uh, a deacon in the church, a leader in the church. And he's getting her to tell, you know, take this letter off to the Romans. And um, another thing the letter carrier may often have done is explain any things that were, you know, confusing to people as they read the letter. So here is Paul specifically saying, please welcome Phoebe and um, I'm sending this letter via her. In verse 3, you see he mentions Priscilla and Aquila. So they appear in Acts chapter 18 as a husband and wife teaching team. Interestingly, the woman is mentioned first, Priscilla, which may indicate that she was the lead teacher. Then in verse 7, you hear the mention of Junia, who is, um, Paul says, outstanding among the apostles. I also love always to mention Lydia. She appears in Acts chapter 16 and she's a, she's a businesswoman, a successful businesswoman who's converted by Paul's message and she wastes no time. She takes the initiative, invites Paul and his companions into her home and you see by the end of the chapter she's already got a house church meeting in her house that she's the leader of. So there's so much indication in Paul's letters that he values the ministry of women alongside men. I don't have time in this talk. It's outside the scope of this talk to talk about marriage. And we're going to put up some blogs that Josh, our senior leader, has written both on marriage and le women's leadership in the church. So that if you've got further questions, you can have a look at that. But, you know, the instruction... Um, that Paul gives for women to submit to their husbands and for husbands to love their wives is a pretty radical statement. You know, Paul says husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. This is a huge, a, a hugely radical statement in Greco-Roman culture where Roman men didn't love their wives. And I think it's just as radical in our culture you know, I think I would know many married women who are not Christians who've never experienced that kind of sacrificial love. So I don't think there's anything demeaning in that teaching at all. And I think one of the other things we could think of, of is the fact that under the New Covenant, all these women who are raised up in leadership in the New Testament, they're, they're people, they're women who are filled with the Spirit. Because under the new covenant, you know, Acts chapter 2 says that the spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And so that's, the, that's what we have access to. All of us, men and women, we've got access to the power of God to, to raise us up and do amazing things for the kingdom of God. Just quickly, there are two difficult New Testament passages about women that you see in Paul's letters. And I'll just quickly, briefly mention them, but they also come up in Josh's blog if you want more info. So 1 Corinthians 14, 34 says, a woman should be silent 
But in the same letter, Paul instructs women on the appropriate way to pray and prophesy in church, which are clearly speaking activities. So if you read the whole thing, not, don't just pick out a verse. If you read the context, you kind of go, well, what is Paul talking about in the first thing? Well, a problem in the Corinthian church was that there was no order in their church service. There was all this disruption. So people would be jumping up and speaking in tongues or someone else prophesying over the top of someone else and, and perhaps women calling out and asking questions. And so Paul's saying, no, 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 there needs to be some order here. I need this group of women to be silent so that we can bring some order. So it's a specific direction to a particular pastoral issue rather than a universal statement that applies for all time. The second passage is 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12. Women should not teach or have authority. But we've already said in other places, Paul clearly affirms women who are teaching in the church. And so what the thought is, is that this was also a specific pastoral um, instruction to Timothy. So Timothy is a young pastor and he's got this church in Ephesus where there's a big temple to the goddess Artemis. And as part of that cultic practice in that temple, women would be there subjugating men and grasping violently kind of for authority. And so if these women had become Christians or had become interested, they may have been coming into the church and Paul's saying to Timothy, these women are not appropriate to be teachers in the church at this time. They need to first learn Christian doctrine and they need to let go of their cultish practices. So, you know, this is how we would understand it in a divergent church, these particular passages. Um, and, you know, I've mentioned Josh's blog and I just want to say the reason I'm standing up here is because of Josh, you know. Um, he's an incredible risk taker. Um, in my 20s, I had this thing inside of me where I felt, I felt like I wanted to teach the Bible. And I really, there was a bit of angst inside of me and I didn't really know what to do with it. And I remember writing in my journal one day, God, I'm just going to put this thing that's inside of me in a box and I'm going to lock it up and I'm going to throw away the key. And, you know, in the meantime, I did lots of other fun things in the church, in the various churches that I've been a part of um, on my journey. You know, I love the creative arts. So I did worship leading and drama and puppets and all sorts of crazy things. And I've taught scripture in schools, which has just been so much fun. I've met so many wonderful Christian people from other churches, and I've done that for more than 25 years, and I'm still doing it. And so, so you know, I wasn't upset or angry. I, I just got on with other things. And I think, you know, we have to have that attitude of, um, you know, doing what God puts in front of us instead of wishing we could be doing something else. But, you know, I came along eventually to, to Divergent Church from a long story I won't tell you about. And then I had this terrible family tragedy that happened and the church ministered to me whilst I, I went through a grieving process. And then Josh, in his wisdom, uh, decided that it would be a good idea for me to have a go at teaching. Josh picked this woman who was not from an ACC background, not a pastor's wife, not with a theological degree, you know, who even disagreed with him on certain matters of doctrine and who didn't really have a life story that was full of huge successes, probably more disappointments than successes. And Josh, in his wisdom, thought it was a good idea for this woman to come and to say a few things. So I'm just so incredibly grateful for, to, to Josh and his willingness to take such risks with people who could really screw things up. Um, and you can see, you know, the impact of his leadership and Cade's ongoing leadership and the other, you know, leaders in the church, Murray and Kieran, who continue to allow women to, to have a go and, and express their gifts. You know, um, we've got Taylor who started the Rahab ministry. We've got Rachel who's gone over to Turkey and Jess who's gone to Spain. And, you know, uh, numerous women who are leading life comms and, and gathering leaders and so forth. So there's no shortage of wonderful role models um, and examples of women stepping out and, and listening to the Spirit of God and taking some risks. So, you know, there's a lot to be thankful for um, in, in, in the vision that Josh has had and the, the way he's set things up. Um, 
I do often think, though, also of the verse in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, 6, that says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand and he will lift you up in due time. And Josh always says, you know, don't go around looking for a platform. Just serve God where he places you. So, so my conclusion tonight is that the Bible is not anti-woman. I don't believe the story of the Bible is a sexist story. I believe it actually provides a wonderful vision um, for us to go forward and to truly live uh, and create a community where there is equality. You know, our world um, tries to bring equality about and some good things have happened. You know, there's more women in politics and business and so forth and, and that's a good thing but there's this undercurrent in our society. You don't have to dig too deep to see the power struggle that continues between men and women. And the problem is our culture can't address the, the root of the problem. And as we've said earlier, the root of the problem is sin. That's what causes the power struggle. And the gospel is the only thing that can address that root problem of sin. And as we all come to the cross and we come in repentance and we bring to Jesus those things that cause us to be in conflict with one another, either you know, just men and women or just other people in your life, as we bring those things then, um, and, and together submit to Jesus and submit to the cross, and, and be willing to walk forward together with him, then we can, we can create a community where, which is truly inclusive and where everyone's gifts are valued. And we can say, along with Paul, in Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's a wonderful picture. And I want to invite you to think about that this week. And I want to challenge you this week. Are there things in your life that cause you to have conflict with other people? Is there pride? Is there selfishness? Is there, is there um, self-seeking in your life? I want to invite you to come to the cross this week and bring those things that, that disrupt equality in our community and prevent you know, the flourishing of every person in our community. And, and then, you know, we can go forward and do amazing things for God. So let me pray. Jesus, we just come to you in humility. We bow before you and, and say thank you. Thank you that you have dealt with the problem of sin. You go to the root of the problems and the brokenness in our world. And we are so thankful to you for doing that. And Lord Jesus, we, um, we bring to you any areas of our life that are not in line with you and your way of doing things and your, li your way of living together in harmony. I pray that you help us um, and, and walk with us as we seek to create community that just looks so different from what's out there on offer in the world. And uh, we pray that you'd speak to us by your spirit about what... what role you want us to play and what great new initiative or, or simple act of service that you want us to do this week. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.